So first of all, Don, thank you so much for having us. Well, it's a pleasure and <laughs> honor to be interviewed by you and for this organization. <laughs> well, I guess the first place I'd like to start is by asking you, I know you've told this story before, but still I'd love for you to tell us, how did your mother and her storytelling skills invent cognitive behavior therapy? Well, that, that's a, a funny way to begin. Um, so uh, I had been interviewed by a similar interview like this for the Association for Behavior Therapy. Mm -hmm. and the they archive asked series. Me, yeah. Right. And they asked me about the origins of cognitive behavior therapy. And I was really prone to um, give a very scholarly review, going back to pre-Freud all the way through the variety of people from Korbzinski to um, Adler to Kelly to Beck to Ellis and so forth. But then in, in, a, in a kind of honest moment of truth, I uh, shared an interview that I did for Dr. Michael Hoyt, which uh, was a journey of a psychotherapist and his mother. Mm -hmm. And the story, if you, if you want to begin with, is kind of interesting. My mother's a Jewish mother, who, and we grew up in New York City. Uh -huh. My father died. He, uh, she went to work, and each day she would come home and have dinner with me and my two sisters. And my mother, on various occasions, would tell us about what her day was like, okay? and ask us what our day was like. But she was really more interested in telling us her day. <laughs> so my mother had a very interesting way of telling stories. And what she would do was um, not only tell what transpired at work, some kind of stressful event, she would also go public with her internal dialogue of the kinds of thoughts and feelings she had during the course of that event. And moreover, she would also provide an editing about which were good thoughts and which were bad thoughts, and, and the accompanying feelings uh, that went with it. And then she would model for us in her storytelling way um, uh, what were alternative thoughts and feelings that she had, okay? I mean, so... so <laughs> the I whole package. Dinner, right, so I ate dinner with this woman for multiple years, and I went to graduate school at the University of Illinois, and uh, majored in clinical psychology and did a dissertation on training schizophrenics to talk to themselves. Mm -hmm. I figured they were doing it anyway. I might as well influence the nature of the process because <laughs> I, really, I really saw the schizophrenic process as an editing problem. So, I mean, we all have flashing thoughts to our head. The question is, do we edit it? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is the same kind of problem that President Trump has. You know, in the, in the sense of how one, you know, has thoughts, but perhaps you shouldn't tweet it. Anyway, I won't go. They have too many right. fake news. Right. So what happened was that was the start of my career. Uh -huh. So then I moved from where I got my Ph.D. in Illinois and I moved to the University of Waterloo in Ontario. So what did I do in Ontario? I worked with a whole variety of clinical populations, and I essentially taught them to do what my mother does all the time. Okay, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, if you trace this, okay, in terms of the nature of the stories that people tell themselves and others, which is where I'm now in terms of constructive narrative perspective, mm -hmm. um, I, I attributed the origins of cognitive behavior therapy to my mother. You can give all these other people credit. <laughs> But that was sort of the, the start of it. And uh, in the end of one chapter, I, I, I wrote a, a question as to how the field of psychotherapy would have been different if my mother had written Walden II instead of being Skinner. <laughs> no, we wouldn't have wasted all those years of thinking that cognitions and emotions were unimportant, you know, or just discriminative stimuli. Anyway, yeah. well, you asked for it, then that's, that's, that's the origin. And... And it becomes kind of interesting if you look at my graduate work from the University of Illinois to where I am now, 40 years, 45 years later. Uh -huh. I started off with the notion of cognition being uh, subject to the laws of learning, mm -hmm. you know, like other. In fact, the term there was covariant, you know, operant cognition, that kind of thing. And then it moved into information processing. Yeah. 
And now I suspect we'll get into it. I'm into a kind of constructive narrative perspective. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Look at, you know, what are the stories people tell themselves and others and what can we do to influence? Yeah, you actually have a... a... You ask for the story, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> actually, you have a great uh, 1990 free paper on JCCP on those free metaphors of cognition. And we'll get to that. And, oh, great. Yeah, no, yeah. But before that, I'm still really interested and I really want people to know about you also. So I'd also like to go back to the Bronx, I guess, when you were near Yankee Stadium. Uh, uh, okay. You were living near you, Woody Allen. Your... Yeah, I do my homework, you know, I'm a fan. So, okay. <laughs> and so I, I guess you grew up reading, and this is what I wanted to ask you a newsletter. Yeah by a guy who I'm also a fan of called Easy Stone. Yeah, I have Stone, yeah. I have yeah. Stone. So Stone, right, yeah. For people who don't know I have Stone, could you just tell us who he was and how did he influence you? Oh, oh my God. Well, uh, I have Stone was an iconoclastic news reporter. Mm -hmm. And he had a newsletter that was very, very well influential. And essentially what he would do is dig into dirt <laughs> about... Uh, government policies and plans. He would never interview them. He would always do the research. And he was a kind of critic mm -hmm. and uh, irreverent guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, there were other people as well, but he was a model for me. Mm -hmm. And um, in what way? A, a real model, you know, in terms of uh, a charis what's called a charismatic adult that one looks up to, uh -huh. that guides you. And in the I.F. Stone tradition, I and Scott Lillenfeld just wrote an article called How to Spot Hype mm -hmm. in the Field of Psychotherapy mm -hmm. that, that we may have a chance to talk about. Because unfortunately, uh, there are exaggerated claims and we put together this uh, 19 item checklist uh, that's going to a journal that's going to come out in professional psychology mm -hmm. and I think I have stone would be very very proud of my carrying on in his best tradition you know the unfortunately the field of psychotherapy is filled with bullshit mm -hmm. and, and and these energy psychologies and all of these kinds of procedures of tapping it it goes on and on we review it in the article so I um, I was very bred on that kind of uh, iconoclastic, mm -hmm. critical uh, approach, and uh, you know, and that has been that's been characteristic of my entire career. You know, I've had run-ins with Ellis and Bandura and all of these people over the years. Um, you had that uh, article, Doctor Ellis, please stand up confronting yes, him on the that, lack of empirical right. research. And, yeah, and then I, I had this whole thing with Bandura on self-efficacy yeah. theory. And, and it, so I, I take pride in uh, sticking it to. Yeah, uh, in being the are, IF stone of psychotherapy. I, I, you could, I would be very happy if that was my eulogy. You know, that would be, uh, you know, Here's another example. You know, I'm I'm a research director of the Melissa Institute. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa was a young girl who grew up in Miami, and she uh, got carjacked uh, 21 years ago and was murdered. And her family transformed their pain into something that could good could come of it. And uh, they created an institute called Melissa Institute. I'm very proud they. Uh, the website for the Melissa Institute, www.melissainstitute.org, this year alone has had two million hits worldwide. Wow. So, so here's here's the Eye of Stone kind of piece on it. Yeah. So we have an annual conference, um, and this year we're doing it on fa children and families who have been victimized. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of the material from the conferences are online that people could download free. Mm -hmm. So I just finished... Um, the handout for this forthcoming conference. And in there, I have a section called Beware. Mm -hmm. These are for educators and school systems. And I enumerate all of these kinds of interventions that are advocated, you know, the tactile foundation with touching, Dan Amon's stuff with regard to spec things. 
And so I enumerate in the best eye of stone tradition, <laughs> warning signs for educators not to be duped. Because these people are really slick marketers. Mm -hmm. They really know how to package their material. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'll accept uh, your, your notion of being the eye of stone. And I continue on that tradition. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I, I have to admit that I was really happy when I read that article because Scott Lilienfeld is also one of my favorite authors right now in yeah. psychology. Yeah. And so, yeah, a great collaboration. Yeah. I was going to ask you later about it. So I'm sorry for bringing us always back to the past, yeah. but since I'm kind yeah, of interested cool. in the connection. Yeah, sure. I mean, you did grow up in the heyday of behavior therapy. Right. And there's this fascinating story where at a certain point in the Association for the Advancement of Behavior Therapy, that yeah. you and people like Mike Mahoney are trying to get cognition into the discussion. And of course, you're met with some hostility. And there's yes. even that wonderful article by Joseph Wolpe, I think it's in 76, and you make it to the list. You're blacklisted as one of the heretics. Right. So <laughs> it actually was called a malcontent. Malcontents, exactly. Right. Yes. So that that's a funny story, too. I, there was a... There was a... Um, an association of behavior therapy conference in Washington, D.C. And I was attending it. You know, I was a beginning sort of researcher in the area. And I had um, uh, attended the meeting and people came up to me and they said, congratulations, congratulations, you made the list. You made the list. And I, so my immediate reaction was somehow I had made President Nixon's list <laughs> on all the people who should not attend the White House, okay? <laughs> you know, and there was a singer named Eartha Kitt. And, and I thought, oh my God, I am on the same list as Ooh. Eartha Kitt? I mean, I have made it. And they go, no, 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 that's not the list. You made the list of Joe Volpe, of all the malcontents in, in the field of psycho, of behavior therapy, you know, with Arnold Lazarus, who he had an animosity, and Mike Mahoney, and Terry Wilson, and Margot. And so we, I, it's okay. It, I would have preferred Nixon, but I'll live with good enough. With, you know, it, it's actually interesting, okay? Because here's a good footnote for your people. Uh, at one time, articles that used the word cognition would not be published, like JABA would not Journal Association for Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, and and there was an effort by um, people who were. Uh, key in the area of behavior therapy um, to exclude cognitive types wow. from the association. And there was a meeting at the AABT meeting in Atlanta. Um, and at that meeting, Beck and Mahoney and Goldfried and Wilson and myself, we met. And the question was, should we vote from AABT? Mm -hmm and create a separate group. And I had put together a newsletter, yeah, uh, w which was uh, one that sort of pulled together all new researchers in this area. Mm -hmm. And the question is, should we go ahead? And, and there was a guy, uh, we, we actually developed the, the journal Cognitive Therapy and Research, Research. Mm -hmm. out of that meeting. But it, it's really interesting now that you have the Association of Cognitive Behavior Therapy, that historically, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And in fact, I'll, I'll just give one plug. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rutledge Publishing asked me to review my uh, various uh, oh, yeah. uh, articles Please. that are influential over the 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put together a book called The Evolution of uh -huh. Cognitive Behavior Therapy, a Personal and Professional Journal. And... Um, since you show such good judgment, I will send you a copy if you send me uh, your mailing address. <laughs> That's uh, well, I would love to have a signed copy. I have so, to admit that I already read the book, but I, wow. I, I hope to one day get a signed copy of it. <laughs> okay, uh, that would be my pleasure to do so. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's very interesting yes. to sort of see how the field has emerged. Yes. And I must confess that I am similarly critical of cognitive behavior therapy that we might get into as well. For sure we will. You know, as what, are the, what are the real mechanisms of change? Yes, yes. Well, but for especially new therapists coming in who sort of 
accept cognitive behavior therapy as the quote on evidence-based intervention. It's really interesting to think about this change. It, it wasn't as exciting as Freud versus Jung, but there were people who took Mahoney in the back room mm. and said, what the hell are you doing to the field? Wow. Okay. Wow. You were bastardizing it and that people's careers and promotions were being challenged yeah, yeah. Uh, as a result of that. Um, I, I ha I've had the pleasure of interviewing Marv Goldfried and he told me some stories like that of Terry Wilson basically doing a keynote saying these integrative people, what they think they're doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's interesting in terms of the evolution of, of yes. a field. And it's interesting in terms of your own evolution because going back to you, I mean, you spent like 30 years in the University of Waterloo near Toronto. Right. Right. Yeah. And you studied so many areas from anger, stress inoculation. There's right. one particular one I like to ask you about because it ties in with your interest in narrative perspective, right. which sure. is when did you get into the work of trauma? When did this interest start? Yeah, right. Well, part of what I do is I consult at a variety of psychiatric facilities for children, adolescents, and adults. And as you get involved in that clinical population, there is increasing evidence of the historical background, so the adverse childhood experience and what lingers from that. And, um, so it's very hard to address clinical problems like depression or anger uh, or uh, substance abuse, eating disorders, without having a developmental perspective and, and wonder what lingers. So for my interest. It, it wasn't that bad things happened to people in the past. Um, from my appreciation of this, it's what lingers from that. It's what are the conclusions you draw about yourself and others and the future. Yeah. It's what are the stories that people tell themselves as well as others. You see, PTSD is essentially a disorder of non-recovery. Okay. This is the, the fascinating piece. And in, in the Roadmap to Resilience book that I put together, I reviewed the data that in the aftermath of traumatic events, most people are impacted, but 75% of people go on and evidence resilience. And in a percentage of those cases, they even show post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. So the interesting question is what distinguishes the 25% of people who get stuck who had developed PTSD, complex PTSD, and a whole variety of co-occurring psychiatric disorders from the 75%. Mm -hmm. And as I enumerate in the Roadmap to Resilience and in some of the other papers that are on the Melissa Institute website, I think it's the nature of the stories that people tell themselves and others. Yeah. So I actually provide an algorithm of exactly what people need to do to develop PTSD. So God forbid something bad happens to you and you happen to be falling in the 75% group, I have laid out a formula by which you need to do in order to screw yourself up. What you got to do cognitively, emotionally, behaviorally, and most important, spiritually. Because uh -huh. the major way that people cope with trauma is to use some form of spirituality or religion. Mm -hmm. so, so how I got into this was I was sort of driven by that. The other process that became important was I got heavily involved with the National Guard uh -huh. in the United States uh, who were dealing with returning service members from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it turns out National Guard members have a higher PTSD rate than, than volunteer soldiers. And I ended up uh, doing work with them and we interviewed a lot of soldiers to find out about their uh, uh, coming home, homecoming stress, and we listened to the nature of the stories, and from that we were able to identify those people who seem to get stuck versus those who don't. Yeah. And, uh, and if you go to the papers that I've written, I have now enumerated. Uh, I, I see myself as what I call a cognitive ethologist. You know, a behavior ethologist is one who studies behavior, you know, how salmon fornicate going up. So I am absolutely fascinated by the thinking processes of people, mm -hmm. not only mother and the schizophrenics, but so I have analyzed, you know, 
what you need to do in terms of the steps in order to become aggressive. Mm -hmm. You know, how you got to perceive a provocation, the way you got to see intentionality, or what you got to do to become suicidal and depressed. Yes. And in fact, in my most recent consultation on substance abuse, there's a lot of really interesting work by Taylor and their colleagues from UBC, University of British Columbia, on predicting relapse in the area of substance abuse, like alcohol, depending upon the stories they tell. Hmm. So they actually interview people and say, can you tell me about the last time you fell off the wagon or when you were tempted? Mm -hmm. And they then analyze, do a content analysis of the nature of their answers and on the basis of that be able to predict relapse. Mm -hmm. so I am very, very interested in, in, in the nature of those thinking processes. Yeah. So, you know, I'm now 77 years of age. I started off, you know, I was in the 30s. 40 years later, I've come to a circle. Uh -huh. uh, but, but trauma is really interesting. And last item, uh, we just did the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff Zygs, 7,500 people from around the world and so forth. And I had a 90-minute debate with Bessel van der Kolk. Yes. Okay. Now, he's written this a whole book on the body keeps score. Yes. And his focus is on the 25% who get stuck, who develop PTSD. Mm -hmm. And it's a scholarly, incisive analysis. So the whole nature of the debate was... Why doesn't the body keep score of the, on the 75%? Mm -hmm. The rest and of in, the story. Right. And in fact, if you look at the emerging data mm -hmm. on, on the role of broadening and building positive emotions, of forgiveness, of meditation, all those kinds of things, uh -huh. there are neural biological correlates yeah. that go with that 75%. Uh -huh. And I think that's where the action lies. So you've laid out beautifully why you would spouse this, what you call the constructive narrative perspective. It's right. the stories yeah. we tell ourselves, like your mother. Yeah, and, you know, but it's not only the stories. You've got to have the accompanying coping skills and behaviors. It's yeah. not just changing a story. Yeah. People yeah. are good at changing stories. It's how do you get them off the pot yeah. doing things so that they can now perform personal experiments to collect data that this confirms their prior beliefs about themselves and others. You know, so... Uh, that behavioral part of me is still a key element of this perspective. And now you're moving towards another area that I would like to ask you about, which is this interest you have on expertise and the core tasks of master therapists. Right. Before jumping to the core tasks, can you just tell us when did you get interested and what did you get from the expertise literature and what clinicians right. should know about it? Um. I am not only a clinical psychologist, I am a developmental psychologist. Mm -hmm. And with a colleague named Andrew B. Miller, who was at the University of Toronto, we became very interested in uh, children's performance in school. Okay. So some children achieve well and other ch students fall further and further behind. So in fact, when students enter school, they enter uh, with a wide discrepancy up to, up to two to three grade differences in vocabulary and the like. And by the time they get to high school, uh, the teacher in that class may be confronted by students who differ by up to five or six grade levels, okay? So what happens is some kids keep getting smarter and smarter and doing better and better, and other kids fall further and further behind. Mm -hmm. So we did a, a good deal of research in a book called Nurturing Independent Learners. Okay. Uh, have faith. This will take you to the, your question. I have okay. total faith. Okay. So, Actually, I was reminded that in the 70s you had such nice papers on spousing creativity in kids. So I remember right. those papers. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that became interesting is we saw that these kids who were succeeding were rather independent learners. And in fact, we characterize them as experts. They were experts in creating learning environments. They were experts in having multiple trials where they actually could exercise their frontal lobe. Teachers would ask them questions. Who could tell us what we did last? Who could be a helper? 
Okay, so we did observational studies of these kids in, in vivo, uh, listening to their stories that they told themselves and others. And so that narrative perspective was there. That took me into the whole literature on expertise. Okay, so I reviewed in this book, you know, expert chess players and bridge players and goal players and uh, musicians and athletes and so forth. You know, and and one of my colleagues was a guy named Neil Charnas, who uh, is who did research on expert chess players and so forth with Erickson and the like. Mm -hmm. So I would have debates with him. And it became apparent to me that over and above the knowledge that these kids have and the strategies and the performance and the opportunities for deliberate practice with feedback, uh, not only did that characterize the students who were achieving, but that that expertise model could be readily applied in the area of psychotherapy. Hmm. We would train various therapists to do these interventions, the stress inoculation, the cognitive behavioral and so forth. And some therapists were really quite effective and others were less. So we could see the ones who were best performing as quote unquote experts. So that raised for me, what were the key features of their task mm -hmm. that were leading them to success? Okay, this is a, a kind of uh, same question that Scott Miller and the ex, you know, their whole group and Lambert and all these people have been concerned, Bruce Wampold. And so I was in that tradition. So we enumerated a whole variety of core tasks, the most important of which is obviously the quality and nature of developing a therapeutic alliance uh, and the way in which therapists need to monitor that in terms of this kind of feedback informed treatment. Uh, but over and above developing the therapeutic alliance and monitoring it and addressing ruptures and so forth, we enumerate a whole variety of other core tasks. Uh, and these core tasks included um, the art of questioning about how to nurture hope, which was a key, how to do psychoeducation, how to teach intra and interpersonal skills. But the key is not only teaching the skills, but how do you increase generalization? How do you increase the likelihood of people applying this over time and over settings? And, um, and we've also included on the website what you need to do before, during, and after uh, the training task together. How do you build in relapse prevention, self-attribution? And most importantly, there were a whole bunch of other core tasks so that if you had someone who had a history of victimization, either recent or in the past, what, what are the kinds of tools you need as an expert therapist to address the immediate symptomatology? You know, nightmares, sleep disturbance, dissociation, uh, depression, suicidality. Uh, and then how do you get people to tell their story and get them to have helpful stories? Mm. Uh, how do you help them find meaning in the, in the kind of Viktor Frankl sense of the word? Um, uh, and then most importantly, how do you get them to reconnect and finally, how do you avoid future victimization? So That's a lot of we, things. Right. So we have enumerated some 12 core tasks. And, you know, when I give workshops, I have very detailed handouts on how to implement each of those tasks and how people could evaluate. Mm -hmm. So if you go into, especially for CEPI and SBR, uh, you know, there's a really increasing appreciation uh, that, you know, these people who get better results, you know, if you look at the Scott Miller, he was a recent presenter at the Melissa Insu conference kind of thing, you know, they, you have this feedback informed treatment and their big pitch. And I just wrote a chapter for them was how to do deliberate practice and get feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the really interesting question is what should you practice? Okay. Yeah. If you really want to become an expert, you know, and how do you reflect on your performance once you get feedback? So my core task, you know, like how do you nurture help, hope? How do you use the art of questioning? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you use how and what questions to get people to tell the story? How do you help people use their meaning making activity or spirituality? So, you know, I, you know, I've done five day workshops on how to integrate spirituality and psychotherapy. I'm at what Eric Erickson calls the generativity phase of life. Hmm. Okay. You know, uh, and that is to give everything away. <laughs> so everything that I write, okay. If anyone's interested in following this up, 
please go to www melissa m-e-l-i-s-s-a institute.org okay i'm leaving and, the link on the video right and if you have no and if you have nothing to do <laughs> on a rainy afternoon you can call up any of these papers these workshops but not only by me we have invited an impressive collection of people you know ann Mastin, betty fedebaum uh deblinger uh you know, and on and on. So all of the materials there. Yeah. Not only that, in my work on the Melissa Institute, we've been also interested in reducing violence. Okay, now this is interesting in that if you want to prevent a violent youth, I mean, how does someone get from being born to killing Melissa, right? It turns out that one of the most important skills you need to develop in young children is reading comprehension. If kids can read by grade three at grade level, they rarely if ever get in trouble with the law. Wow. And there are 400 free movies on the Melissa Institute website on how to teach young children to read. Wow. I mean, so. It's very impressive uh, research. It's more than just me. It has all of this other <laughs> things on bullying, on reading. Uh -huh. But and, you know, So this is my generativity phase. I want to put a plug for you because I loved reading a lot of the stuff that you had on the Melissa Institute website. And actually, as a clinician, one of the sentences that I use a lot that I stole from you is that idea of how much of what we ask here do you also ask yourself outside? Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you have a lot yeah. of those wonderful... Yeah. And sort of, let me ask you something a bit different, if I may. Uh, do you ever find yourself out there in your day-to-day -day experience asking yourself the questions that we ask each other right here. Yeah. And essentially what you're conveying to the client is that therapy is a kind of cognitive modeling, right? Yeah. Okay. Now my mother never said that. You know, do you ever find yourself out there doing what <laughs> I do, right? right? You, it was by osmosis. I did it, you know, and then I go, oh, oh, I get it. That was what my mom was doing, okay? I mean, so, I mean, she still lives. Uh-huh, uh-huh. In spirit. Um, you know, but the yeah. goal is to have them become their own therapist, right? Yeah. It's to have them take your voice with them. The goal is to have them notice, catch, and edit. Yeah. Yeah. Know their stories, relate to them in a different way. Right. And know what the triggers are. And, you know, so we're, we're trying to make sure that the emotions, the amygdala, yeah. does not hijack the frontal lobe. But you know, Don, one thing that's really fascinating for me in your career is exactly this, because you grow from behavior therapy, but you have all these other influences. Even when you're a cognitive therapist, you're already speaking about narrative processes. And now with these core tasks that you described, that of course we don't have time here to cover them as they should be covered, so mm -hmm. everyone should really read those articles you mentioned. You know, they do seem very common factory, Jerome Franke, in a way. Mm -hmm. And... So I'm kind of tempted to ask you, is, does it still make sense to call you a cognitive behavior therapist or just a therapist? Um, I, uh, I, I, would, uh, I, I think where the field is moving in this integrative fashion, that these labels of uh, being cognitive behavioral or what have you uh, are going to fall by the wayside. You know, I, you, know I have, you have a certain identity that has been pass on with you and um, you know if you look at our hype article essentially what we're doing is we're sort of challenging uh, the movement towards certification and insularity of therapists and try to look at um, what makes some therapists more effective than others you know I mean that, that's what the clinical excellence yeah. websites about and all the feedback informed treatment and, um, you know, so I'm, you know, my, my last task um, is to take all of the materials that I've been doing for giving workshops for 20 years and doing training and, and putting together a kind of a manual, especially for new therapists, on how to implement all those core tasks, uh -huh. you know, um, you know, so if, if you're going to develop a therapeutic alliance, what what essentially does that mean? If it's going to be the art of questioning, like the question you like, what are the questions that should be in repertoire? Uh, how do you do psychoeducation 
uh, in a way that doesn't lead to um, people resisting. You know, we did a whole book on treatment facilitating treatment adherence, you know, uh, where most people don't follow through. If you're going to teach skills, how do you build in generalization? So, so essentially what it would do, it would enumerate all the core tasks for you. Yeah. Okay, and it would lay this out, like, uh, do you want to uh, develop the art of questioning? Do you want to do relapse prevention and so forth? And you would be able to evaluate yourself as saying, no, I, I, I know that already, you know, or I'm not interested in that. Or you could say, I'm an expert. Not only do I know it, not only can I do it, but I can teach it to others, okay? I'm, I'm your man, okay? <laughs> and then there would be a middle category called budding skills. That means you would be interested in learning and fine-tuning your ability to do that. Yeah. And you would click that, and then all the fine-tuning skills would pop up. Mm. And then you could pick and choose about doing it, okay? So this is, but yeah. here's the trick on it, okay? Mm -hmm. It is unlikely you're going to do that, even though you're going to spend time, okay? Because you're going to be non-adherent just like the patient. <laughs> so you cannot access the budding skill until you have a partner ah, good. who is going to work with you. Uh -huh. And unless you do it, the partner does not get access to it. <laughs> okay. So Smart. I want you to know that I have been raised on guilt. Okay. So I have built guilt into this kind of training program. Okay. If it works. Call you up and say, Alex, you said you were going to do it. Okay. <laughs> You're not going to do it. I can't gain access to this, okay? So go ahead and practice that, okay? <laughs> so that, that's my last. That, you, you can look forward to this coming down the pike. Yes, I really. now I really want to do it. And, you know, the guilt, if it works, it works. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, someone else, you know, if you were part of a group, uh -huh. okay, you cannot gain access uh -huh. to that material until you performed all those kinds of tasks. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, so that that's what I'm presently working on. That's awesome, and I really want to get access to that as soon as possible. <laughs> right, and, and you gotta give me the telephone number of someone who's gonna call you up on a regular basis. Good, let's do that. Well, you know, just to to finish off, I'd still like to ask right. you two more things, which is okay. we were talking about the hype of psychotherapy and yeah. how there's a lot of bullshit, basically. Yeah, right. So, using your own recurrent sentence, I'd like to hear the rest of the story and know what excites you now in terms of uh, therapy offers or books? Is there anything coming out that is not hype and that you want people to be more aware of? Other than what I wrote. Other than what you wrote, of course. Because that, of course, people will read. Well, you know, I, I guess I um, am impressed with the... Um, uh, the notion of uh, the work by Miller and their co Duncan and, and Wampold, you know, on on the characteristics of expert therapists, you know, I, um, uh, you know, there's there's some critique about the role deliberate practice plays and what are the factors therein, but the fact that we can go ahead and identify on an empirical basis those um, therapists who seem to be getting better results. Um, uh, so, so I find that an encouraging direction and, uh, uh, so, so that, that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect that I find rather fascinating has to do with the nature of resilience and some of the, the, the papers and others that we have contributed to on what characterizes these, um, People who make it in spite of. I mean, yeah. you, you look at the world scene today with natural disasters and war-related and interpersonal violence and so forth. And to, to see people pull their lives together in spite of it, it is, from my perspective, the, one of the most interesting yeah. elements therein. And, um, and even though the concept of post-traumatic growth is interesting... Um, uh, you know, there, there's some recent findings, I'd say, and others that suggest that, you know, I, I always characterize it as ruminations being one of the formula algorithms, you know, of brooding and pining and so forth as, um, 
as contributing to your being in the 25% group. There's some recent work that says that people who become, have evidence growth, actually really obsess about what they got out of it. You know, so <laughs> you know, as, we, as we start to look at people who are making it uh, and who are transforming their lives into gifts for others, mm -hmm. uh, studying that particular subgroup is where I would be, you know, if I started my career all over now. Mm -hmm. um, and the final piece is the neurobiological correlates, uh, positive emotions. The fact that there are recent studies by Caspi and others whereby you can actually impact gene expression, okay, that you're affecting the telomeres um, of, at the end of the chromosome levels um, uh, is fascinating. Uh, Belsky and others have looked at and I just reviewed this for the forthcoming conference, um, have looked at children who participated in the fast track program. This was a major intervention for high risk kids. Mm -hmm. And they found out that some kids benefited from the intervention and others didn't. Mm -hmm. When they went back and did a gene analysis of these kids, they were, could predict which kids benefit from interventions and which don't. Now, if, if there's some, if this gets replicated, this raises some really fascinating possibilities of having vulnerability markers yeah. as to who would be responsive. Because yeah. you don't have funds or personnel to implement these interventions for everyone. Could we identify either in terms of the biological markers or cognitive markers or others, vulnerabilities and, and tailor interventions? Yeah. So, so to answer your question, the research that's emerging with regard to what characterizes expert therapists, mm -hmm. the research that's emerging with regard to what characterizes uh, people who become resilient, if not evidence, post-traumatic growth, and the notion of genetic variation uh, and biological changes that accompany positive activities, forgiveness, yeah. the meditation, gratitude, uh, humor or exercise and so forth. That's what I think is the cutting edge. Well, it's wonderful that your answer kind of encapsulates your career as well and all that you've been working on in different areas. Well, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your, your homework and gracious interviewing style. I, and I'm pleased to be included as number 40 something on top of it. And uh, <laughs> let me just end by saying if anyone who watches this has an interest in the hype paper mm -hmm. or in anything else, they can just email me at D H M E I C H at AOL.com. D H M E I C H at AOL.com. I'm putting all these links on the description box of the video and on the video. And just one last thing I wanted to ask you still, yeah. because I've asked all of the colleagues in all of the interviews okay. is what advice would you wish to have received? when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? Uh, one advice. Uh, watch out for hype. <laughs> watch out for hype, okay? You know, just become the eye of stone, okay? I, I can't believe that people who get PhDs go to these workshops and sit there I mean, I, it's not the same profession that I'm in. I mean, how could they not go, e excuse me, I, I, I mean, just, you know, just do not give up your frontal lobe to slick Mac marketing. I mean, that's, that's Eye of Stones. As far and as I'm concerned, Don, you are the Eye of Stone of psychotherapy. So well, let that's, me... I, that's, that's the most gracious compliment I can get. Well, then let me just say how wonderful it was to chat, and I hope we meet in any conference or whatever. <laughs> you bet, you bet, you bet. When you come to the States, let me know. Okay. Or get me an invitation to Portugal, and I'll even be there. <laughs> we'll make it. We'll make it happen. <laughs> right. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much, Don.